Welcome to The Real News, I'm Jess Lenore. The Trump administration's response to the coronavirus pandemic has been nothing short of catastrophic. Instead of using the Defense Production Act to create badly needed personal protective equipment, Trump is using it to reopen meat plants shuttered due to outbreaks of COVID-19. Meanwhile, Congress has passed an unprecedented stimulus package that will give up to $6 trillion to corporations. But the vast majority of its benefits don't go into the pockets of ordinary Americans, including the over 26 million or one in seven workers who have filed for unemployment thus far. Instead, this bailout represents one of the biggest transfers of wealth to those who need it least this country has ever seen. This begs the question, where are the Democrats? Well, our next guest has some insight into this vital question. Ryan Grimm is the DC Bureau Chief for The Intercept, author of We've Got People, from Jesse Jackson to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, The End of Big Money and the Rise of a Movement. Um, so uh, Ryan, thanks for joining us for part two of this conversation. Um, I thought your, your book is really helpful in this moment because it, it sort of gives insight into where the Democratic Party is right now. And, and just, you know, they have, it seems to a lot of people feel like they have not really addressed the needs of working Americans. And, you know, so many, the, the, the cracks in this stimulus, this response have been massive and they, they just announced they're going to be recessed. They're not coming back next week. They're going to be recessed even further. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this current moment we're at? Yeah, so a lot of people note when they look at the Democratic leadership on TV, you know, how geriatric they are. But what they don't think about is, well, what does that mean about those people's life experiences? Uh, and in, in my book, I go into detail about, you know, how, you know who these people are and what kind of politics they experienced in the, in the 1970s and 1980s that formed their politics today. Because whether we like to admit it or not, a, a lot of our view of the world is, is really shaped as we're coming into our own. Uh, we, we, we all try hard to you know, c continue to learn throughout our lives and to continue to incorporate um, new information, new experiences, and, and, and evolve our, our, our way of thinking. Uh, but that isn't in practice that easy to do. And so, you know, millennials, for instance, uh, no matter what, are going to be deeply shaped by the financial crisis that they, that, that they lived through as they're, you know, emerging into adulthood. And now, again, you know, shaped by this, this crisis, again, as they're emerging just from, from the last one. Uh, Gen, Gen Xers have their own, uh, you know, series of things that help shape their worldview. People like uh, Chuck Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, uh, Steny Hoyer really came of political age in the late 1970s, early 1980s, uh, amid the kind of right wing backlash and the, and the Reagan revolution. You know, that 1978, there was a huge midterm wave that brought people like Newt Gingrich uh, to Congress and which presaged Ronald Reagan's victory in, in 1980. It's hard to overstate, you know, how crushing that 1980 election was for, for Democrats in particular ones who are, you know, just getting into, getting into, into politics like, like the current leadership was. Because you didn't just have the incumbent Democratic president thrown out of office. You had him thrown out of office by what they saw as a rodeo clown, uh, this, this actor uh, from, from California who wasn't running like the moderate Republicans that they had come to understand. You know, the Richard Nixon you know, as, as a lot of people now know, like he signed the Environmental Protection Act into law. Yeah, that sort of thing. Like the, the, this, this was not your grandfather's uh, Republican. This was much more of a Newt Gingrich revolutionary type of class that came in. Not only did, did he win, but they lost 12 seats in the Senate. You know, just an absolutely extraordinary trouncing. And they didn't just lose a massive number. They lost senators uh, who'd been in some cases for four decades. People who had you know, been the pillars of what, what it meant to be a liberal throughout the 20th century, you know, leaders in the fields of environmentalism and consumer rights and uh, uh, anti-war. Frank Church, for instance, you know, loses his race in 1980. Um, Mike Gravel actually lost a primary uh, in, in, in 1980. And an entire generation uh, wiped out. Birch Bayh, who had uh, been a, a kind of a liberal lion who had been a front runner for president in 1976. By 1980, he's, he's losing his, his race. And so Democrats feel like they've just been, you know, thoroughly rejected 
uh, by the American people and that the American people are, are, are a, a center right people, you know, that, that any hint of kind of progressivism or liberalism is, is going to be uh, 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 tossed out. And so, you know, they, they retrench and they, they reorient themselves around a, a, a strategy to raise tons of corporate money so that they can hire good consultants to, uh, you know, to win back these swing districts and, and these, these middle of the road uh, voters that uh, are so elusive to them. And, you know, any, any hint of a tick to the left, you know, it begins to, you know, scare them that there's going to be another backlash uh, in, you know, when they, when they finally, you know, get back into the white house with, with Bill Clinton, thanks to Ross Perot, you know, cleaving off 19% of the vote in the, in the general election, two years later, their worst fears, another backlash, boom. 2008, they, they get back into the White House again, uh, and two years later, boom, uh, you know, huge, huge backlash. And so, uh, you know, over and over again, the Democratic leaders have lived through these uh, backlashes against what, you know, against any Democratic advances. And so they have just internalized the idea that if they do anything, they're going to get hammered for it. And so Nancy Pelosi has now taken that to its logical extreme and has adjourned the House, scattered it to the wind, preventing preventing it from actually doing anything other than uh, responding to whatever the Republican Senate sends its way and then having to do it through some version of, of unanimous consent because the uh, members aren't even in in the house floor you know the virtue of that strategy would be there can can't be a backlash to it theoretically because there's nothing to backlash against if you're not doing anything um you know they they also are are hoping in in this context that that donald trump will will so set himself on fire politically that democrats will just kind of walk backwards into controlling uh the house senate and and the white house in 2021 and you know no, nobody at this point can tell them that they're actually wrong about that and what's what was interesting from um you know attending some of um, the sanders rallies uh we covered them in iowa and new hampshire and some other other states is that that was exactly the point that people like aoc were making they were saying we don't want to go back to what it was like you know before trump we're trying to build a new vision for society and you know treat you know, just treat, have a different relationship, have a, have a social contract like we haven't seen in, you know, in this country. I think one of the most interesting parts of your book, one of the most relevant to this moment is how you covered the recovery from the 20, 2008 economic crash. And you talk about the role that not only corporations and lobbyists played in, in shaping the recovery, but also that progressive lawmakers and progressive groups played. Um, you, talk, you talk about groups like Indivisible, which, came, which were prominent later, but, but groups that actually were able to help change you know, change laws and help, um, you know, sway, sway the president or, or sway Congress one way or the other. Um, and so you have, you have those lessons, but you also have Joe Biden appointing someone like Larry Summers to be, you know, an unofficial advisor at this point and, uh, you know, an advisor outside of his campaign. Um, you know, we talk about wh- where we are today compared to this uh, previous crash. Right. The, the left has been um, battling with the, 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 Democratic establishment trying to push it to to be you know more aggressive for for decades and it and it really did you know flame up in you know in, in the first couple of years of the Obama administration but the what Robert Gibbs who was the press secretary at the time uh, called the professional left you know were often handicapped by the fact that a lot of these uh, liberal groups rely on the same donor network and Rahm Emanuel was making calls to that network telling them, you know, if they, if they criticize blue dog Democrats or if they criticize Obama, you know, I want you to, I want you to cut off your funding. And so it, you know, it, it required the left to, to, to build, you know, a, an independent kind of gra- grassroots structure that could, that could challenge uh, the white house and push it in a more, in a more progressive uh, direction. But in, in a lot of ways it was, you know, there, there it was a desert. Uh, the congressional progressive caucus was, was was meek, wasn't you know wasn't able to um, you know extract many concessions from from uh, Pelosi who you know who's who's an adept tactician and parliamentary infighter and also has a lot of experience you know fighting the left you know she often says look I understand progressives I'm a progressive I represent San Francisco it's you know one of the most progressive cities in the world 
but you know, as I write in the book, she, you know, she uh, got to office in a contested primary where she was the kind of establishment business friendly candidate against a uh, the vice chair of the local Democratic Socialists of America uh, against an insurgent grassroots campaign, and it was it was a a race that she only won by a, a few thousand votes. And so when she says, you know, she understands the left, she, un- she understands them in conflict with them, um, not as kind of uh, somebody who kind of led an insurgent movement to come to the House of Representatives. And so, you know, the left has been, been losing these fights in, internally for, uh, for, for years. And, um, you know, they're, they're still struggling to gain much purchase in, in the House today. And I guess, um, you know, you're, in your book, um, you, 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 your, your, your title is The End of Big Money and the Rise of a Movement. And I think it sort of can give hope at this time for progressives who've had a really tough year to really put it in the, in the context of, you know, where things were when um, you talk about the campaign of Jackson in the 80s and how, you know, he was totally shut down by the Democratic establishment. And just, just to see how Sanders' campaign was so different, him, be, him being a, a front runner for, you know, a few, you know, for several weeks in this election, um, what, what are your thoughts about, you know, how far the progressive movement has come and, and the work that really remains? And so the end of big money, uh, that's kind of an aspirational subtitle. Obviously, big money is still here and um, continues to play a major role in our politics. But the, the rise of small money has, has changed the... The, the playing field and it, it has enabled someone like like Sanders and other and other insurgent candidates to com- to compete in, in a way that at least puts them on a footing where they have a shot at winning doesn't guarantee victory and they're very rarely going to outspend uh, their opponents but it, it gets them to a threshold place where they're at least viable and where they're where their ideas have to be uh, considered. In, as part of the conversation, and when they are, uh, voters tend to, to react favorably to them. You know, the next the next step is is continuing to professionalize it, uh, and to persuade voters to, away from the idea that they've been inculcated with that uh, liberalism, progressivism equals losing. You know that that the, if that if if you have a a left wing candidate, therefore they're going to be rejected by the the, the population. A lot of voters, particularly baby boomers, have very much internalized that idea. Uh, you, you, you saw it play out uh, after South Carolina and into, into Super Tuesday. You know, part of this is demographics. You know, the, the party is, is getting younger as, as baby boomers, you know, gradually age out of it. Uh, though there's kind of a ticking clock uh, as, as the, the, the world confronts this, this, you know, these different thresholds when it comes to cataclysmic climate change. Um, but at the same time, the, you know, the world is not going to end. There's still going to have to be um, a, some some forms of government, even even in uh, you know a, a post climate apocalyptic uh, scenario. And so that's what makes the organizing uh, today, to, you know, building community and building social bases that much more important. All right, Ryan Grimm, thanks so much for joining us. Author of We've Got People: From Jesse Jackson to Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. The End of Big Money, and the Rise of a Movement. Uh, Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, great to talk with you. And make sure to catch both parts of our interview at therealnews.com. Thanks so much for watching.